This session is to do with the answer data, as we call it. Uh, some four years ago, Peter and I, well, it was actually Peter, I'll take no credit for this. Peter uh, said we really need to get some information out into the industry. Uh, it is shameful that we actually don't have great confidence in understanding the number of vehicles that are on the road and uh, their types and their age and, and so on. That led us to saying, well, where is this data? And the self-evident answer to that is the registration database. Uh, as you all know, that's driven at the state level. And if you've tried to deal with states in Australia, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a challenging task. Uh, fortunately, uh, some 10 years ago, uh, the states came together and under uh, an organisation called Austroads, which is an umbrella organisation of all the state road authorities in Australia, uh, they put together a, a data team uh, called NEBDIS, and you might have heard that word before today, which is the National Exchange of Vehicle Information and Driver Service. There's a D in there, that's right. And, and part of the driver of that was to uh, make sure that if you were pulled over in Queensland by a, a police officer, that he could check your licence and see that you're a Victorian registered person with a Victorian licence, but he wanted, or they, wanted to know whether indeed you were legal, and up until then they couldn't do that. So that was one of the drivers with a national uh, enforcement uh, system which allowed them to check that Peter Hart indeed was legal, did have a licence, and his car was registered in Victoria, even though he was intercepted by a Queensland police officer. So the collection grew from there, uh, in, in our discussions with uh, Austroads, uh, we said that our industry really needed some data to understand the size of, of the industry. And uh, four years later, uh, we're standing here today. Uh, it's been a mammoth task. Uh, the data, as uh, anyone who's looked into that, and we heard uh, earlier from you, uh, data is always a challenging task. Uh, and it's extraordinary what the registration authorities have not done and could do. Uh, and hopefully in the future will do. Uh, so we've taken their data, we get about, uh, Andrew, one and a half million records uh, on a quarterly basis. So I think we throw out 600,000 of them because they're Toyota Corollas that are registered under heavy vehicle and things like that. So we, we do a lot of cleaning up and over the years we've worked with uh, some of the industry forefathers, uh, Stuart McMurtry is sitting there. Um, Stuart has been immensely helpful over time, uh, the Maxi Trans people. Uh, John Stewart at Hendrickson, uh, Stephen Grinesic uh, at uh, Sam Holland, and uh, uh, a number of others as well, have helped us to work on this data and do some sense testing to make sure that it is uh, pretty good. So we've done a lot of weeding of the, uh, the Ostro's garden to produce this data. Uh, you've got it on, on the table here today, a full page brochure, which tells you, uh, in essence, what the collections we put out. We have a free quarterly report uh, we have some analytics report, we have detailed registration statistics, we have specialist reports, and we have some answer directories, and that will become evident as we go. Uh, unfortunately, there's no such thing as a free lunch, and, and, and we're somewhat enjoying it here today, but um, this collection has taken a lot, a lot of time, and uh, uh, we pay quite a handsome sum to uh, to members to access the data and the privilege of them cleaning it up. So uh, we will explain that over time today. I think that this is a really commercially worthwhile exercise. And Peter, we now, our assessment of the industry is now that we are at about a $5 billion per annum industry in terms of new equipment and also replacement parts. Um, that $5 billion new. New equipment only, my correction. Four and a half tonne and above. Four and a half tonne and above. So uh, there's a lot of good data that comes with that. I think uh, Arthur would like to use some of those numbers uh, for future lobbying in terms of research and development funding and a whole bunch of other things that we can do at an industry level. In the meantime, this is your opportunity today to understand uh, the commercial worth of this data. And uh, Peter and Andrew are now going to drill and de dive very deeply uh, into this data for you. So uh, we'll uh, ride all the way through the lunchtime. So I'll hand over to you two. Uh, thanks, thanks Rob. I think uh, this is an important project that has been labour of love for quite a while. 
Uh, Andrew, tell this audience what you do for a It's not just analyzing the truck drivers. No, I wish. Uh, my name is Andrew Perkins. Uh, I spend a decent chunk of time working on this data, on cleaning up this data and producing reports and stuff like this. Uh, and the presentation today is going to be a combination of me and Peter, where I'm going to present the numbers. So I say that Peter is going to give some background and some, some analysis. Uh, I also do some other software development work. So in the case that you are looking for some assorted software development, apps. Yeah, come and quote me a seven-figure fee. We'll <laughs> okay. Good. Good point. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the presentation will mainly deal with uh, two data sets, the road vehicle certification system and also the NEPTIS data. And there will be a lot of detail. Please stop us. We want this to be interactive. We don't want it to be boring. Uh, it's important to understand the definition of heavy vehicles and light vehicles, etc., in Australia, because we're all kind of a bit confused. Heavy vehicles in, in a legal sense are, have a GTM or an ATM rating above one and a half tonne. There's an intermediate vehicle group, three and a half to four and a half tonne, that are somewhat forgotten. Bear in mind that in Australia, four and a half tonne is the heavy vehicle license domain. So the manufacturers supply a group of vehicles in the three and a half to four and a half tonne domain that you can drive on a passenger car license. And in many respects, these vehicles are often uh, similar or the same as vehicles above the court of time. This is certainly true of the motor vehicle space. Then we've got, uh, we're very careful here. We, we don't want to just concentrate <coughs> on four and a half and up because that's it's too broad. Four and a half ton vehicle doesn't look like a 12 ton vehicle. So we introduced terminology here that we're going to use throughout this presentation, so please understand. A medium duty vehicle is in the four and a half to 12 space, and a heavy duty vehicle is, in, is above 12, 12 tonne. And you'll see those terms used on our graphs and our reports. We, uh, we have data, we will, we, our reports cover both the medium duty and the heavy duty domain. The intermediate domain we in theory could look at, but we haven't looked at it yet. I want to talk about the road vehicle certification system. Just as a show of hands, who in the audience uses this system, looks at it, is a participant, goes to the website? A few? Well, yeah, I know you would. There's, there's, uh, there's a huge amount of information there on this website, and we've tried to extract it. Andrew has, has done the uh, Chinese uh, extraction technique, and, and we've got a whole lot of good information out there. Uh, National Exchange of Vehicle and Driver Information, NEPTIS. Who has any dealings with NEPTIS? Couple? Huh? Okay. Uh, if you're, if you're a motor car trader or a licensed motor car trader, you might be putting information into members through the road agency. So you may have some in the grid deal. It's all, already been mentioned that there is a, an ABS motor vehicle census. I'm just going to touch on that briefly. That occurs every few years and it doesn't involve trailers, and that's a fundamental problem for the, the heavy duty segment of the market. And there's also an ABS motor vehicle usage survey, which is sort of interesting and helps us, uh, gives us a check on what we're doing because we were able to report that our analysis of the NEPTIS data is consistent with the, the ABS reports within you know, less than 1% or something. If you go to the RBCS website, you'll find this front page. And one of the uh, picks over on that left side is uh, vehicle stroke RVD search. So you can you can actually search on any uh, vehicle make, vehicle model, and you can, you can see in the public domain approval letters and hopefully some ratings of that vehicle. 
So here's a search. You can also, this is the search window. Uh, you can specify a category. TD happens to be a heavy trailer in the ADR set. And if you've got enough download capability, you'll get the whole current list of trailer approvals. So here's a, a graphic. This is what comes up when you search on heavy trailers. And you get a whole list of uh, makes and models, owners and models, or licensees, as they're, they're called. And you can go exploring and find out a little bit more. And you might say, oh, money, I've got uh, six there, seven. And I haven't got anybody I recognize. If you do this test, if you do this uh, check in the trailer, heavy trailer space, you'll find it's 470 licensees. And so the market has a huge number of players in it. And these are these are only the, the ones that are known to the Federal Department of Transport because these are approvals, compliance plate approvals. We'll come back to the detail in a minute. You can have a look at the uh, approval letters that are there. It tells you who the letter was sent to, for example, the address. It tells you a little bit about the vehicle. In the motor vehicle space, you can, you can look at photographs of the vehicle. You can look at ratings. You can identify variants. So there's, there's some really interesting info there. It doesn't tell you about market share, of course, but it does tell you about what, what's on offer in the market. Uh, I might just quickly jump in. Um, so, before I said there were 470, there's 363 whom I regard as uh, commercial suppliers to the market. There are also some modifiers uh, of trailers in the system. Uh, in the trailer space, the all of these suppliers get their VIN numbers, I think, with no exception that I can think of. All of their suppliers get their VIN numbers from a road agency or from the federal department of transport. This is how the trailer industry is now controlled. You have to, you can't make up your own VIN number, you actually have to get it from effectively the federal department of transport or you might get it from big roads. And this, this is a, a control that's been added recently it wasn't always this way. The administrator of motor vehicle standards has been unhappy with the compliance level in the trail industry and is now controlling the issue of compliance uh, of numbers through to, to its agent, which is a company called Nutri Nameplates. This is where most of the trail industry is getting quotes from. Come in. Yeah, sure. So, just from a what we as ATSA provide, so what we have done is we have gone through and collected all of these uh, manufacturers and approvals and all that important information about them. So we do have that available, which is a list of all the manufacturers that have current trailer uh, registrations available uh, and also for approvals and also details about all those approvals, including things like typical bins and ATM and further detail. And so that is one of the that we, we have available to them. Yeah, we'll, we'll show some. Of that. <coughs> so, in the, in the motor vehicle space, if you do the same sort of search on any category in C, you get another list. And there's, there are a lesser number, but still a significant number, 100 and so, sorry, that's not, that's not 75 uh, licensees in the heavy vehicle system. The majority of those, as we'll see in a moment, majority of those are actually second stage of manufacture licensees. So they take an OEM vehicle and they modify it. And the advantage of being in the compliance plate system is that the compliance plate for the modification should be accepted to all the states. So uh, you bore down and that you'll find eventually you'll come to some uh, some major players such as Hino here or Isuzu. But most of the players in that uh, system that you'll come across are actually second stage of manufacturers. We'll come back to the report later. I've actually put them in with trailers and trucks and 
Peter. Peter, yes. if you don't stay close to the microphone, people down there can't hear. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Hold the mic. Okay. I now want to talk about the NEMDIS database, which is the bulk of our analysis. And this is a database that is created. It's, there are actually two aspects to it that we're interested in. There is a never registered database, and this is where the VIN numbers end up in the first instance. And when the vehicle is presented for registration, the VIN number gets changed, gets moved from the never registered into the registered vehicle database. The VINs get into the never registered database from the imports group or from NIDRI nameplates. NIDRI nameplates is the uh, Federal Department of Infrastructure and Regional Development's agent. If you want to get a compliance plate and you're a licensee, you go to NIDRI nameplates usually and you pay some money. They check up on the approval, check that it's valid, and they will then transfer the VIN to the DIRD vehicle group who will in turn put it into the never registered database. State road agencies may also do that and approved licensees do this. So in the, uh, in, in the motor car vehicle space, the heavy truck motor vehicle space, it's actually the licensees, the Kenworths, the Hinos, the Azuzus, who make direct submissions into NEDDAS. They check out the data and then they put it into the never registered database. Now the tick data, is reporting the never registered or new vehicles that are going into the database, the never registered database. Some of those vehicles may stay in there for quite a long time. It's not registration data, it's, it's new data, new vehicles from the manufacturers. When the vehicle gets presented for a, a registration, the registering authority transfers the vehicle into the registered database and adds a whole lot of information about it. In fact, there are 27 data fields, whereas in this case there's only a few. <coughs> so at the registration stage, the data gets transferred. One of the uh, data that should be in there, for example, is body type. And that, <coughs> that information either comes directly from an inspection by a registering agent uh, authority or it comes from a license motor car. Andrew, please tell us about this. Yeah, sure. So this is just going to be a quick look at the never registered VIN database. So as Peter said, this is the kind of database that vehicles are going into before they're registered for the first time. So once they've gone through someone like Nitric, uh, and we've kind of done a bit of an index here and looked at five uh, top trailer and truck brands and kind of pulled out not only some information about what their never registered or unregistered number of bins were, but also how many uh, new registrations they had. So turning those unregistered bins into registered bins. Uh, so what we can kind of see is that we have around, uh, as of July, we have around 1,500 unregistered trailers that exist in this database, and we are registering around 700 of them a quarter. Uh, similarly for trucks, we had around 2,000 unregistered vehicles and we're registering 1,200 a quarter. So kind of what we're seeing here, pretty, uh, and we're starting to see if we get more of this data, is that it's around a two to one ratio. So you need, if you had, if all, uh, there were no more unregistered vehicles added to the uh, unregistered table, it would take around two months to wipe, two, uh, two quarters, sorry, to uh, wipe out that backlog, which, so, we think this is useful because we expect that it will show some trend trending. So we presume that if the market turns up, then this index will go down. We don't know, we haven't tracked it long enough to be confident of that, but that's, that's our logic in doing it. And uh, so far, we, we haven't split trucks into medium duty and uh, heavy duty. That's a bit more difficult. Some of the manufacturers cross over, uh, but we, we can develop this in the future. <laughs> Same thing useful. Um, Stuart, is it possible in the unregistered list that there are units that will never be registered? Yes. Yeah. 
So they, there will be a basement staying there, I take it on. So plates issued that will never leave the bottom yeah. drawer? Yeah, so we do have the date that they entered the database, and obviously when they leave the database, they're not there, but uh, the, the vast majority of them are recent vehicles within the last two or three years, but there is definitely a tale of vehicles that have stuck around in there for, for a while and just never been registered. Maybe we should get rid of, we should have a, a time limit on them. We can so, sorry, ignore them after so, uh, oh, we, Sorry, uh, to clarify on that, we, we do ignore that. So we have that data. The vehicles that were shown up there are only vehicles from the last 15 months. So are they vehicles or are they issued plates? They are VIN numbers that have been allocated for a given manufacturer or Brand, I suppose, that so, they will then turn into a natural registration. So there may not be a vehicle for every one? That is potentially correct, yeah. Okay. Can you go back to the slide? Yeah. So, tell me I'm reading this wrong. There's one of the traders and all of the new registrations in quarter two. There's 733. Is that telling me us? Uh, in the second quarter, only no, 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 because we've we've got we've chosen a group of manufacturers. This isn't all of the manufacturers, so don't worry about the numbers there. We'll tell you more in a moment when we get to it. But it's just an index of, of, of um, unregistered vehicles. Now, the NEPDAS database. This is the registered database. We go through it and clean it up. We, we insist, we ensure that every vehicle has a current national registration code. In fact, this database has different registration codes in it from different registering authorities in the past. Over the last five years or so, we do have all of the states have been working with the same registration code system, national code, but there's a lot of cleanup that's new. Our number one priority is to get a current, accurate registration code. And so, for example, the Prime Mover has an SP3, SP code, three axles, and it's got a three on the end. So this is just showing you the, the codes that we work with. And Andrew, can you remember how many codes do we end up with? The ones are on those slides, so there's probably around 50, a bit less if I had to guess. Yeah, I think it's more than that. I think there are 80. No, 95. Yeah, there you go. So, so we've differentiated, we split this vehicle group into 95 registration codes. And we go a bit further. Uh, I'm not going the wrong way. There we go. We go a bit further, further because we want to differentiate between. Uh, the 4.5 to 12, which we call medium duty vehicles, and the heavy duty, which is over 12. So we put a 2 at the start of the code for heavy duty vehicles. We put a 1 for medium. We haven't got to lights, but if we get to lights, we'll put a 0 there. So is that clear? This is a fundamental differentiation of our data. There are 27 data fields. Andrew, tell us about them and what confidence do you have in them? A lot. Uh, so <coughs> what we get in from NEVDES is basically a dump of their registration database. And that includes a whole lot of different fields. Uh, we tend to focus on the fields that we, uh, we know are reliable. The, the primary problem that we have is that different jurisdictions often submit different data. Uh, and since Nevis is a national system, we get all those jurisdictions data, but they're not necessarily consistent in terms of what they fill out. So we, we do get in a whole uh, bunch of data fields, and we tend to focus on the core ones that we use, uh, in particular looking at things like charge code, uh, JVM, and you know, a variety of others. Make Make code. Make model. Yeah, uh, and it's basically been an effort over the past couple of years to clean this database up and make it consistent between the jurisdictions. 
Uh, a good example is, is make code and make description. That is something where the fields typically are consistent within a jurisdiction. Uh, so a maxi trans will be called a maxi trans when it's in Victoria, but it might be called a maxi T when it's in New South Wales, for instance. So creating a consistent index between that so we can tell consistently not only what are the charge codes between different jurisdictions and old vehicles and new vehicles, but also make other information. So um, these are the codes that, that Arthur is using. It's about 10 or 12, and we're so we, we, we have to use some of this to actually determine what registration codes are applicable in many cases. Answers value add. Um, so we're trying to determine a consistent radio code, make model, vehicle body type, although we're having some trouble with this, I must say, age and the, and the vehicle ratings. Uh, we're having some trouble with body type because some jurisdictions simply don't put it in and others are inconsistent in how they describe the image. What's missing from Nebus? Um, this is a conversation we have had with Austroads. Uh, the RVCS approval number is not in there. If it were, we would know exactly what the make model was and what its rating was. The full VIN number, we do not get the full VIN number. It's redacted, the last five uh, characters are redacted, and that means that we can't follow an individual vehicle. Why do they do that? <coughs> Secure, uh, privacy. privacy considerations. I, I don't know, I, I don't see the point, but that's, that's where we're at. The answer is we cannot link a registration to a Vehicle. Yes, so the consequence is that we can't say that particular vehicle was retired in such and such. We can't look at an individual vehicle and say it went out of the database or exactly when it went into the database. No, that means it. But we, we do have to fill it, we have to work in totals. So, how many did you say? 17. 17. But we only get the third day. So, we want four digits on there. So just to pursue that, if you had the top 10 or 20 or 50 manufacturers and importers sign a letter saying they're happy to have it released, would they do it? No. Because uh, there's a sensitivity about the market players uh, complaining to lost roads that sensitive information is being released. And we've already have been through this. We're, we're walking quite a tightrope. We can't publicly release market share information, for example, because we've made an agreement with us we won't do that. We can do it privately, but not publicly. Uh, I, I want to mention just in passing a couple of other databases. The ABS Motor Vehicle Census data uh, was referred to in the previous presentation, and one of the slides from one of the graphics in that for the last <coughs> version, which I think was 2015, has got a breakdown by categories. You see the light vehicles, the blue, articulated, non-freight trucks, heavy rigid trucks. And in fact, when you look into their classifications, th these vehicles are less than three and a half tonne right down. They're, they're not in the three and a half to four and a half. So I just want to make the point that there's different definitions of vehicles being used in this space, and it's quite difficult to, to compare apples with apples. Um, and it was noteworthy in the survey, there's a survey that the ABS also put out in which they, they report uh, body types for the industry. But again, it's, uh, it needs interpretation depending upon the, the nature of the, which category of vehicle. Um, I think we'll jump over that. I think probably, yeah. So let's talk about uh, <coughs> heavy duty trailers. We've got an RVCS report, I mentioned that previously, and uh, there are 363 trailer manufacturers holding 1,229 approvals. Of the 363, there are 79 
who have more than four approvals. So 79 out of 360 a quarter or so, and less than that, 20 percent have more than four approvals. And you might say, well, they're the bigger players. That doesn't mean they're selling all the trials. It just means they hold a lot of approvals. Of the 1,229 approvals, 88 percent have Australian VIN numbers. That is, it starts with six. This is an, in, an industry, as we know, that is mainly Australian made. About 85% of the trailers I think we find in our data are actually have, a, have an Australian VIN number. And that's just a graphic that shows, shows that Australia is predominant. There are some other uh, vehicles from other countries. New Zealand has a couple, etc. But basically it's an Australian manufacturing yeah, industry. Just going back to Australian VIN numbers. Yeah. There are Australian manufacturers manufacturing overseas with Australian VIN numbers when they Right, so possibly we'll We can't we can't separate them. Yeah. Tell us about this. Uh, so we're now going to jump into what is the new uh, release of the arts and data, which is the new format we're putting out, which is going to be uh, a bit more graphical and give an overview of that. So we'll start with the trailer industry. Uh, yeah. This is a look at the total registered heavy duty trailers. So this is the amount of active registered tra heavy duty trailers that are on the road in Australia today. And the answer is they're around creeping up on 240,000 over 12 tonne trailers. Heavy, heavy duty over 12 yeah, tonne. Over 12 tonne. Uh, the kind of looking at the split down, we also managed to split that down by what type of trailer they are. And you can see that semi-trailers constitute the, uh, the bulk of that somewhere in the range of 60% of all trailers that are currently registered are semi-trailers. Uh, there's a bit of a, a fight down the bottom between all the other types of, of trailers, including leads and dogs and, and so on. Uh, as we go forward, we can kind of see that this is the total registration numbers. As we look at new registration numbers and things like that, you can see that that dynamic starts to shift and some, there are some up and coming types of trailers. Um, well, perfect space, I think, is going to scale. I've just got an old, uh, an old slide with uh, some market data on it. This is, this is to do with the total uh, market, total registry of semi-trailers, and it identifies some big players, the shares that exist. I'm really putting this slide up to show how difficult it is to deal with this database, particularly the old stuff, because the, the other column is the biggest, and the not listed is also fairly big. So we know they're semi-trailers, but in terms of getting reliable market data, main model data, we have a problem here, with the old stuff in particular. Our, our data, the quality of our data for the last 20 years is much better, but historically the data is quite bad. Um, and that's... Uh, lead trailers, it's also true of lead trailers. Some of, in, in many, some cases, the data field has simply not been filled in by the rate agency. Tell us about this, Andrew. Yeah, sure. So, again, just looking at total registered vehicles, uh, and this is just a breakdown according to what we are seeing uh, in an annual change. So, Basically, what we've, we've tried to do here is see what's moving, what's coming up, and what's going down. So, lead trailers and dog trailers are the two things, the two types of trailers that are growing at a faster rate than any other type. Semi trailers are going up. Uh, and the, uh, I should note here, when this says other trailers, uh, these are trailers that we, we cannot classify into any of these types, other types, uh, because we don't have adequate data. Typically, they're greater than 30 years old, uh, and they're not. There's not that many of them. So the fact that this is going down is this is kind of going down at a natural retirement rate. What this importance is showing is what is the, the market share of each of these. So 65% of all the registered set are bit at trailers, sorry, are semi-trailers. So you can see the lead trailers are going up, but they actually only consist of 10% of the market. 
Uh, and yeah, I think that's quite a good overview of the state of the uh, what is happening in the travel industry at the moment. Let's talk about new. Yeah, so if we look at new registrations uh, as opposed to what is currently registered, so this is looking at a yearly basis. So in the past financial year, how many trailers have been registered? Uh, there have been 9,137 trailers that are being registered, newly registered in the last financial year. Uh, this is down from the, the year previous to that. And as we're going, we'll see that some of this is a bit of a, an industry trend of, you know, we had depressed sales from last year, and some of it is a, uh, an actual, you know, trend of things are going down faster than that, that overall rate. Uh, so we can see, again, it's very similar to the uh, total registration data in that semi-trailers are the dominating force. <coughs> so over half of the new registrations are semi-trailers. Uh, but as we can see, that there are some things that are outperforming what you would expect. In particular, lead trailers sell 1,500 units a year, which is kind of what, over what we would expect given that current market share. So the difference between this graph and the previous is the previous one was a total registry, and it, it is affected by retirements as well. This is this is new additions, not affected by retirements. What's new? What's new? Vehicles can take up to 24 months to get registered. So they, <coughs> we we see that uh, vehicles can come out of the never registered database up to 24 months after we think they were put in there. And so because we can only analyze totals, we, we say the changes in total for vehicles less than or equal to 24 months are new. Whereas effectively assuming that no retirements were in the first 24 months. And then we say that changes in the total vehicle vehicles that are older than 24 months must be retired because they tend to go down. We know vehicles must at some stage be retired, get out of the registry. We can only view the totals, so we're looking at the total number of vehicles that are older than 24 months and we find that total is going down with time and we declare that change to be the retirements. You might say, oh, there might be re-registration, new vehicles, I don't know, special reasons why some go in that are older than 24 months. We can't deal with it. We just treat the total and we track the total and we, we see the full and we say that's a retirement. Yeah, uh, I suppose from a, from a number point of view, at around 24 months out, uh, you, you tend to e even out on registrations versus uh, retirements. Basically what I'm saying, you run a net zero typically when you're around 24 months out from a, from a hit date time. Uh, this is basically just the looking at the numbers of the graph that we were looking at before. Uh, again, this is uh, kind of going to be looking at what is changing. Uh, so, in the past 12 months, the big winner has been dog trailers. Uh, so, dog trailers, again, similar to before, they're only consisting of 10% of new registrations, but they're actually growing at a, a, a quite a quick rate. Uh, lead trailers are going up. Again, uh, semi-trailers have gone down 11% in the past year. They do, however, consist of 60% of the market. So a lot of that 11% that the semi-trailers have gone down, I think is uh, probably to do with the, uh, the overall trailer market being a bit weaker for the year, rather than semi-trailers in particular. So typically when the overall market goes down, semi-trailers will go down. And it's kind of the ones, dog trailers and lead trailers, the only ones that are bucking that trend. Yeah, so uh, what we're looking at here is new registrations, and this is broken down into a quarter by quarter basis. So what we were looking at before was year on year aggregated data, so financial year to financial year. What we're looking at here is quarter by quarter, and how many new registrations do we have? So you can see that we have anywhere from around 1,700 to around 3,000 newly registered heavy duty trailers that are coming in every quarter. Uh, there's a pretty clear cyclical trend here. Uh, basically, quarter one tends to be a, a bit, uh, have less registrations than quarter four. Quarter two and three tend to be pretty similar. Uh, there's some dispute as to how much of this is um, is actually cyclical and how much is a product of, I guess, the, the data. 
Uh, but what it allows us to do is to look at that and say, to, and to kind of pull out some, some trends, some seasonal trends, and also compare that. So we know that if semi-trailers go up in quarter four, uh, that's probably going to be expected, because typically we've had quarter four being a, a big year. And again, if they go down in quarter one, that's kind of expected. Retirements. What's happening with the retirements? Yeah, so uh, this is kind of a very uh, similar idea to what we've been seeing before. Uh, and retirements are vehicles that have dropped out. So that used to be registered and now are counted as unregistered. And we say there's a pretty close uh, correlation in some ways to, uh, to what we see in the, the totally registered, number of total registered vehicles, in that the vast majority of retirements are coming from semi trailers. What we can see as well is that there's actually a large number of dolly retirements uh, comparatively to what, what we would expect. Uh, so that's kind of telling us that dolly is typically going to be retired younger. It's telling us that the road trade markets in the sense that... <laughs> yeah, uh, there's an interesting uh, number here, which is that there are only eight lead trailer retirements in the, in the last year. So what this is kind of showing is what Peter was saying before is that these new registration and retirement numbers are very much estimates. So what we're saying is that any change in vehicle that's older than older than two years ago, we consider a retirement. And basically, what that number is telling us is that the number of vehicle of uh, lead trailers that are being added two years ago is kind of pretty much equal to the number of vehicles that have disappeared from over two years ago for lead trailers. So that's that's quite a Quite an interesting figure. It shows that they're on. So well, this graphic just shows it supports the slide. I think we'll we we need to keep moving because of the uh, the time pressure here. So we'll jump up if, if people want to talk about specific things as we go through. Please ask questions. But if we had a race, we need to race through some of this. Um, uh, I believe we've seen that. Haven't we? Um, median age. The median age of the fleet is of some interest because uh, we want to know whether our fleet's getting older or younger. Uh, whether if the freight tasks are truly growing, we'd expect that there'd be a whole lot of new gear going in and, and the actual median age of the fleet would be decreasing. So it's to me it's an indication of the state of the, the, the market. Uh, we are working with median age, not average. Average is affected by the tail. The very old bangers affect the average. The median age is not so affected by the tail. So the median age is, as said, equal, in, equal number of new and old. Tell us about this, Andrew. Yeah, sure. So this is kind of what I was saying before. This big yellow bar is kind of showing us these other trailers. So these are ones we haven't been able to classify. And as I said, these are typical vehicles that predate uh, the, uh, the bin. Uh, so, so they're kind of outliers. We're not typically too concerned with them. What we kind of want to look at here is the average, oh, sorry, the median age of a semi-trailer uh, is 11.87 years old, similar to the median age of all trailers, which is 11 years old. So your average, uh, your median trailer is 11 years old. And it's only when you start looking at some of these new and upcoming industries, which are particularly lead and dolly trailers, you can kind of see that they're actually much younger than your average trailer. Uh, what what's, not, what's the lead trailer average? Uh, uh, sorry, lead trailer average. average is around eight years old. So what we can kind of see is that vehicles are typically getting older. So we started at 10, 10 and a half years old at uh, July 1st, 2014. We've been moving up to around 11 and a half years now. Um, Vehicles are typically getting older, uh, and there's only, yeah, really dollies and leads that are younger. Um, so, I think we'll skip that. We discussed it. We want to talk about dog trailers because there's some activity in that space. Total registered? Yeah, sure. So this is breaking down. So we have the ability to break down by axle group as well as by country of origin. So we're looking at breaking this down, dog trailers specifically down by their axle group. Uh, so this is the total registration. So we can see that the by far the most popular type of dog trailer is a uh, dog trailer with a 
uh, one axle in the front group and, and two in the two in the other group. Uh, and we can kind of go through and see that uh, one one is also a popular configuration and two two is the other popular configuration. And there's a, a growing trend of getting uh, getting some two threes and uh, three threes into the market, but they don't really. Do. So that's so we're showing where the the actual difference. And if you look at the difference, even though the uh, the, the TD three threes, that is three axles of the front three axles back, even though they're smaller number, they're they're growing at twenty point seven percent, and the TD two twos are growing at seven percent. Again, quarterly variation in dog trades matches similar to uh, what we saw us before. Peter, do you have a variation in dog trailers by state? Yes, I haven't got it here, but we do have it. Uh, retirements? Uh, yeah, so kind of similar to what you expect, but uh, typically it looks like the one, two retirements are, are the stronger ones, particularly in 2015. Uh, and in 2016, it looks like we had equal retirement between all of those things. Uh, I think it's kind of a probably just an interesting thing to note that these are closely correlated to the total registration numbers. You can quite often see large differences, which are explained by the different types of vehicles and what they're used for. Jump that. Median age of heavy dog trailers. Yeah, so uh, again, you can kind of see some pretty clear trends here, which is all 1-1, one, one, uh, well not all, but most 1-1 one, one dog trailers are very old, 28 years old. 3-1s uh, similarly are very old. The ones that are really an interesting number here is that all 3-3, three, three, so TD 3-3s, three, are uh, on average just two years old, or have a median age of two years. So, uh, so there are very... Are all TD 3-3s, three, three, are they all PPS trailers? Is this your handiwork, please, in that, on that slide? Not all? No. Okay. But many are. Yeah. Many are. Yeah. I, will jump that. Uh, I think we've no, sort of been there. No, that's by content. Oh, by content. Tell us about that. Yeah, so one other thing that we're beginning to look at is breaking down the market into continent of manufacture. Uh, uh, we should clarify when we go into this, the way that we determine where something is manufactured is based off the bin, uh, based off the first character of the bin. Uh, so there can be circumstances where you have uh, a foreign, uh, foreign manufacturer who brings in the vehicle when it's constructed here, for instance, and that might be given a six, which says it's an Australian vehicle. So these numbers are, are purely based on the bin. So, Oh, no. Alright, so the, uh, the trailer market, as we can see, is vastly dominated by Australian made trailers, as we can expect. Uh, these 47,000 other trailers are typically just pre 1989 trailers that don't have the associated with them, but they're probably mostly Australian as well. Hmm. And you can, you can see from this graph just how many pre 1989 trailers there are still in the registry. I think we'll skip that because I think we've done all that. Trucks. Registered licensees. So, getting back to our RBCS uh, data, Andrew has gone through and, and picked out all of the approvals and put it into a standard report format. And we've analysed those and we say that there are, we can recognise in the truck space and, and by the way, we're looking at medium duty trucks here, so 4.5 to 12 tonne. Four Australian manufacturers, eight European, three North American, 12 Asian, mainly Japanese. And that's on the new spoke, the new column. And then there's a second stage stroke, stroke, stroke specialist suppliers, and there's 47 Australian specialists who are actually modifying, mainly modifying vehicles. There are a couple of military suppliers in there as well that are building from the, the wheel nuts up, but uh, mainly they're modifiers. 
because this, this in the truck space there is a significant level of modification that goes on, and we'll try and put a dollar value on that in, in, in due course. Uh, I might just quickly note before we go uh, before we go on, just jump back quickly to trailer uh, registrations. That is new registrations uh, of semi trailers in particular. Uh, you can see that the Australian manufacturers are still very much dominating the, uh, the new registration side of the market. And again, the RBCS licensees in the heavy duty truck space, uh, four Australian, five European, three North American, uh, Asians, Isuzu and Hino, etc. in there. And there are 67 second stage of manufacturer stroke specialist licensees. It doesn't mean that they are <coughs> dealing with many trucks, but they're in there having an approval to modify and put a compliance plate on. Prime movers. Yeah, so looking at the prime mover space, and again, this is just heavy duty above 12 ton, uh, we are breaking this down into what we classify as regular versus multi combination prime movers. So we can see that there are around 100,000 registered prime movers in total, and around 60,000 of them are regular, and around 40,000 of them are multi combination. So you've got around a 60 40 split on uh, total registered of regular versus multi combination prime movers. Yep. So we want to jump simple. that. Just out of interest, uh, so this slide is showing totals of heavy duty prime movers in the registry, not, not what was sold last quarter, totals. And we find, for example, uh, that 22% of the standard prime movers were made by Kenwood in Australia, and 40% of the multi combinations were made by Kenwood in Australia. That's quite an interesting figure, I think. Yeah, so moving on to new registrations, uh, we can see, and again, this is classified on a, a yearly scale. So for the last financial year, we had around 5,000 new prime movements that were registered. Uh, the, the difference here is that around 60% of those were multi-combination and around 40% of those were regular prime movements. So the, the majority of prime movements currently on the road are not multi-combination, but the majority of new registrations are in fact multi combination prime movers. A fundamental challenge in our market to two or three levels. We'll jump that. By quarter. Uh, I think. Yep. Similar, similar trends to the ones we saw for trailers. Yeah, again, so breaking those new registrations down by continent, uh, we can see that the uh, typically, the biggest uh, bicontinent manufacturer is Australia, and we're very closely competing with European prime movers. Americans kind of have a bit of the market share, but it's very much a race between Europeans and Australian prime movers in terms of what is currently newly being registered on the road. Right. So this is the total registry of prime movers as a pie chart, and Notice that in the total registry, there's a very large other segment. Many of these are old bangers without a VIN number. And so you've got to take that into account. You've sort of got to split them mainly into the, into the Australian and North American domains, I think, because as we'll, as we'll see, the Europeans have come up recently. They haven't contributed greatly to that to the old bangers. Yeah, so kind of what that is telling us is that on the road, there are still more Australian prime movers, but they're currently around an equal amount of European and Australian prime movers being registered, newly registered. So if you compare that to the new prime movers, so this is the last 12 months, so I'll just compare it. I'll go back, try and flip the queue, follow the green, which is European. You see there's quite a significant change there that the Europeans have come up. Uh, this is, slide is just giving a sort of an overview of the, the net additions 
uh, it's really redoing what we've already seen, but it's just over a longer period. So we've gone back uh, two two years, and it's it's showing us that there's been uh, the net addition in the prime movement space of 990 units per annum total, but the that wasn't enough to cause the median age to go down. Uh, prime movement flats getting older. <coughs> Um, some of the factors that seem to be making, uh, being taken into account by the market, this is, this is not obviously in the data, this is a, a slide I've generated. Uh, Australian, the market factors seem to be choice of North American engines, reliability, custom building, and service network that consists of the Australians. And I think we should note that the liberalisation of our regulations has been very good for Australian motor vehicle manufacturers, for prime mover manufacturers, because the ability to custom build has been a key factor in success in this industry. Not, it's not price. Europeans, the Europeans are, are really pushing safety technology and ride quality and comfort, and cabin comfort. And they're, they're way out in front in that space. And, and we are seeing their percentage in the marketplace going up. Uh, North Americans, cost, simplicity, low weight. Uh, the North Americans are going down in the market. And the Japanese, uh, quality and features. The Japanese are not big players in the heavy duty primary market. Even though of quality, they're not, uh, they're not big players. Retirements, Andrew. Yeah, so kind of. What we can see here is interesting. It it's, looks very similar to the new registration figures, which is uh, regular prime movements are retiring at a lower rate than multi-combination prime movements. So what this is telling us is that we're adding a lot of multi-combination prime movements, but we're also taking a lot of them off the road. Uh, so there's a huge amount of, oh, there's more coming in and there's also more going out, which means that in terms of absolute numbers, this is why you kind of saw that 60 split is because there's a lot higher turnover in multi-combination, but at the end of the day, they probably have a similar number of vehicles that are staying in the database to regular front movers. Now, there's a problem here that we can't resolve, and that is we think that many multi-combination prime movers get retired and become semi, uh, single prime movers. So they, they, get, they go from an MC code to, to an SP code. We can't track them because we don't have the full bin number. So please note that in making your assessments. Uh, I think we're done with that. Yeah, <coughs> I think that's kind of shown here in that the median age of a multi combination prime mover is only six years old compared to 12 years old for a regular prime mover. And so, as we said, some of these are going to be multi combination vehicles for six years and then we'll get switched over and turned into a, uh, a regular tractor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well that's breaking down by continent. Oh, no. Yeah, okay, talk about it. So we, we're seeing market <coughs> trends, different market uh, trends and continents. What's the, the European prime movers are actually getting younger, aren't they? Yeah, so I think the probably the main thing to look at here is European prime movers are getting younger, Australian prime movers are getting older and are already older than the rest of the other continent's vehicles. Heavy duty rigid trucks, so these are 12 tonne and above. Yeah, so what we've done for heavy duty rigid trucks is broken it up into uh, heavy duty regular frigid trucks, so just heavy duty trucks and then long combination trucks, as well as looking at medium rigid trucks, which is medium duty rigid trucks, which is between 4.5 and 12 tonnes. So what we see is that in terms of total number of registered vehicles, there are around 200,000 4.5 to 12 tonne uh, rigid trucks that are on the road, and there are around uh, 100, 180, uh, just above 12 tonne registered rigid trucks, meaning there's around 400,000, 380,000 rigid trucks that are above four and a half tonnes in total. Uh, 
looking at new registrations, uh, this is kind of a where where we see a very similar trend here. And there's nothing particularly crazy here. That there's around 50% of both registrations, or 50 to 60% on medium, so between four and a half and 12, and around 40%, 40 percent, 40 closer to 50% are above 12 pump in terms of new registrations. By quarter. Yeah, so this is breaking it down into by continent. So we can see that in terms of new registrations, the vast majority of newly registered uh, heavy duty trucks, with uh, rigid trucks, which is above 12 tons, are Asian and primarily Japanese. So you can really see that the, the Japanese section of the market is very, very dominant in the rigid truck sector. Uh, yeah, just a pie chart that just makes that point. So we're breaking it by uh, Japanese, read Asian, but nearly all Japanese, Australian, European, North American. Yeah, so this is showing total registration. So you can see that 50% of the uh, total registered vehicles are Japanese, but the vast majority, something in the range of 80% of new registrations are Japanese. Uh, uh, median age, again, this kind of shows us that long combination rigids are actually younger than non combination rigids. I think it's probably the important thing to take away here. And that there's actually the vehicles are quite old. 14, 14 years as a median age is quite old. What was it for primary? Uh, I cannot look it up. Are we getting younger or older? Um, so again, for basically for all these vehicles, we're mostly getting older. The interesting thing is that uh, Australian heavy ridges are staying around the same. But there's very few of them. So there are very few. Medium duty rigid trucks. Yeah, so this is medium duty. So looking between four and a half and 12 ton. And this is where we can really see the, uh, the dominance of the Japanese rigid trucks. Uh, so basically, 140, so 140 out of around the 200,000 medium duty rigid trucks are, um, are Japanese made. Uh, when we look at new registrations of medium duty rigid trucks, it's actually even more dominant. And it's something, I believe, 92.5% of all new registrations of medium rigids, medium duty between 4.5 and, and 12, are Japanese. So they really uh, have a, a stranglehold on that market. Simon, Simon Humphries, is that your doing? Uh, yeah, so again, we can see that the Australian media bridge at 22 years old it doesn't really exist much in this industry anymore. And that it's typically your, um, your Americans and Europeans are actually younger. So it started to come into the market, but it's still very much a small player. Components. Yeah, so this is something we've started working on a bit more recently, which is looking at uh, looking at components specifically. Um, so looking at things like axles, uh, brakes, and tires. Uh, and so the way that we're doing this is that all our uh, charge codes are, have an axle breakdown. So two. Uh, so an SP3, so a prime member with three axles, that's an SP4, that's an SP5. So using that, we know the amount of axles that are on the vehicle, and just by doing some kind of math and saying, well, it's got three axles, and then therefore how many wheels it's got, how many brake sets it has, depending on the type, whether it's a prime member or a trailer and so on. <coughs> um, so this is something we've been working on. So what we're looking at here is axles. So this is the total number of axles that are on registered vehicles. So axles that are out on the road on heavy duty vehicles. Uh, and the answer is there's around 140, oh, one point, 1.45 million axles that are on above 12 ton vehicles. And we um, haven't we haven't split that down by axle weight or by vehicle rating, but we can do that as well. What we can't do is predict how long an axle is going to last, so we can't 
we can't yet tell you the replacement rate, but that's in the future we hope to be able to work on replacement rate type considerations for axles and tyres and brakes, etc. Yes. Is it just drive axles, not steer? That's a great question. Is it just drive axles? No, no, we can we, we can do both. Because we know what the Rego code is. So you just use the Rego code, you can split the piece to, to drive. Drive this, this as we're showing it is total. Yeah, so yeah. this is total, not broken down. But, this is both drive and steel. But we have drive and steel. We, yeah. we could pull that out, but that this is showing total. So, and kind of the interesting thing here is that actually trailers are contributing the most to the number of axles, or 60,000, sorry, 600,000 roughly uh, trailer uh, axles on heavy duty trailers compared to around half a million on heavy bridges and 300,000 <coughs> on front movers. Uh, new registrations, kind of what we're seeing here is, is very similar, but trailers are contributing most of the axles on newly registered vehicles. And there are around 60,000 axles that are being added to new newly registered vehicles per year. Yeah. So clearly, in the component domain, there's a lot more analysis needed, and we want to work with suppliers to understand the requirements. At present, we're just really showing you what we could do. We don't know what to do with it yet. I'm going to jump through some of this. Brakes, we can do the same with brakes. And we have broken our database up according to continent because we, we perceive that the components that are used on vehicles will depend on where they are. So we, we think we'll have different brakes on European trucks compared to North American trucks, for example. So we, that's one of the motivations for splitting our data according to the country or the continent of origin. Uh, I think I had to go back and make sure the brakes. Um, brakes on newly registered vehicles. We we have around 100,000 that are being added per quarter. Uh, again, the majority are on trailers. Uh, and it, it looks very similar to the axle numbers, but the answer is there's around nearly 3 million brakes that are on heavy duty vehicles currently on the road. When you say brakes, is that this or drop or together? We can't separate them. That's not in members. But what we can do is apply some rules of thumb, knowing where the vehicles were designed. So if we were talking about European prime movers, for example, we would expect there to be disc brakes, whereas in other markets we would expect to have this. That graph was combined. I want to touch on body type. Body type is a bit of a work in progress. Andrew, tell us about this. Yeah, so one of the fields that we get in from the NEPTIS data is, is a field called body type description. Um, what we find, as I said before, is that between different jurisdictions, we find a, a large difference in the quality of data. Uh, so basically, New South Wales is our, our go-to for body type description because they have not only the most consistent, but the widest range of descriptions. Other states uh, vary a lot in quality. So this is just looking at a breakdown of semi-trailers that are registered in New South Wales and what body type they have, have described as. So we can see that uh, tipper trailer is, is the biggest, followed by tabletops, semi-trailers. So for instance, some semi-trailers, this is uh, semi-trailers themselves, so not all semi-trailers have a body type code of semi-trailer. Some are described as, uh, this is actually for all trailers, but some semi-trailers have described the semi-trailer as something else. So it's not entirely consistent, but you can see that we can start pulling out things like refrigerated uh, refrigerated trailers, as well as animal carriers and, and tankers, other kind of stats like this. But I think New South Wales. Uh, I'm gonna say yes. Uh, there is data in the other states, but it's kind of, it, it varies a lot in consistency. Uh, the answer is New South Wales is by far the best in terms of coverage and the fields and the descriptions that they get. We're on safer ground with tankers because we can also we can identify tanker manufacturers. So we also got that industry inside information. So we feel we've actually done a tanker report for Australia. Uh, we feel safer there. Refrigeration, not sure. 
So we, we can look at other uh, jurisdictions and see, but the answer is we typically go in New South Wales as the next source of data. We uh, don't understand why across the fleet, this, by the way, this slide is this title, it shouldn't be semi trailers, should it? It's, it's, it's actually all trailers. Yes, yes. So that's, that's an error on my part. All trailers, according to the New South Wales classification, tipper trailers dominate. We don't know whether that's right or not. Yeah, so the body type description is something that we're kind of working on to try and verify you know, how accurate it is. Is this total registration or is this new registration? Total registration. Uh, I think that's Peter, um, how would that be uh, how would that be affected by the big fleets, the tolls and wind fox registering all their trails in St Kilda Road? The Victorian? Yeah. It's uh, lots of Victorians. I once uh, I once had cause to be in toll transport yard in Perth. I uh, couldn't help but notice that there are six uh, heavy duty road train trailers that were in that yard all registered in Victoria. Uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure about the question that was when you were new or totals. I'd have to get back to you. Anyway, I think there's some further potential. It's a work in progress, not promising anything, but we've got. We, we really do want to be able to give a body type to every vehicle in our database, or relatively new ones at least. Uh, it's a, just a, such a pity that the, there's no discipline in the net that's reporting here. It's, it's a lost opportunity. Um, Grace, sorry, I don't know why that's there. Commercial size of, of the market. Um, these are my estimates, and please, those who who are in the commercial side, please tell me if my numbers are way off or not. Because we can, I'm using average numbers. Heavy duty prime movers, new heavy duty prime movers. So this is an annual number. Uh, there were, for regular heavy duty, heavy duty prime movers, that is SP codes, there were 1,796 registered in the year ending 3rd June. If you say that they're worth 250k, then you get a big number on the right. And the multi combinations I've, I've said are worth 350k. And you get another number. Notice that the multi combinations are way, the, the number of registers is way more than the singles. And you come up with 1.6 billion. Minimal body building in that segment. Anyone want to comment on that? Market size of heavy duty trailers. Uh, Stuart, you've probably got better figures than me here. But, uh, yeah. I said a semi trailer was worth $100,000. I think it was, that's five. Mm. But that includes the whole range, so refrigeration vans, tankers, flat tops. So we might we might argue that whether it's eight or I mean, honestly, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, lead trails are the same. Dog trails 70k. Uh, dolly trails 30. Pig trails 30. Other trails 100. Uh, other trails are fairly much irrelevant, but I think some of those, some of those others in this new category are actually specialist trails, uh, road number year or filling. I don't know what they were. Anyway, you come up with 0.78 million dollars. You do that sum. Uh, the heavy duty rigid truck segment, so this is 12 tonne and above, and I've got 150k for a, a standard truck that doesn't pull a trailer, and I've got 250k for a truck that pulls a trailer. And I come up with 1.1 billion in that domain. Market value of medium duty, so this is 4.5 through. Um, 4.5 through 12, and I come up with 0.76 billion. I forgot to mention on the previous slide, this market segment has lots of bodybuilding going on. All of these trucks get body of some sort, and I've I've estimated that the cost of the body is 30k, so that gives 228 million as an additional cost to this. 
this market segment. So if you add all of those up, a new, new supply to the market over the last 12 months, I get 4.93. And if you do some basic calculations regarding uh, the Australian made component, the Australian value added component, if you like, and these are guesstimates. So if you take trailers, for example, you'll see there's a 0.9 factor in there, and that's supposed to account for the fact that most of the trailers are Australian made, but some of the some of the value on the trailers may be imported. So if you say value add uh, and you and in the prime end space of 0.5. If you do those sums, you find that the Australian manufacturing value add is about 2.5 million, which is conveniently about half of the total. I'd be interested for any feedback on this because these are purely estimates. And, uh, I think it is important for us in our uh, project to estimate market, market value. I think we have quite a considerable, in fact, a world leading manufacturing sector here producing vehicles that are not used anywhere else in the world that government just simply doesn't know about. And uh, there's, there's some manufacturing going on that's just not being recognised. With the actual values, wouldn't the stamp duty be able to give you an actual, actual figure? Because you pay stamp duty every right here. Yes, for and sure. They're going up to value. Yes. Except, uh, I haven't mentioned this presentation, but there are a seven or eight percent of the prime mover fleet are actually federally registered by those stamp duties. But uh, that's a trivial, a trivial thing. Um, point taken, it's just not in our need to start a base. And so I'm, I'm just relying on average values, and I'm hoping that people who know these things can, can help us get good figures. Because it's not, it's not about who's making money, it's about representing our industry government so that the government knows how, how big and important it is. So answer reports. We have uh, you, you take us through this because you that yeah sure. So like I said before we kind of have four categories. Uh, what we're looking at here is the free report uh, which is something that's released quarterly uh, put up on the answer website you can download the free and gives an overview of the industry uh, and kind of high-level fitted of what's happening in terms of new registrations and retirements and totals. And it's a medium duty and heavy duty. Uh, what we're launching today is our new analysis reports. They are what has formed the basis of all these slides and have shown all those graphs that you saw. Uh, and they basically break down according to Richard truck or prime mover or trailer and break it down into what's happening in terms of totals, new registrations, retirements, uh, as well as what's happening on a quarterly to quarterly basis, and also breaking it down by, by country or by continent uh, and saying, you know, how many uh, prime movers are Australian versus European, how many new registrations. So what we've walked through today. Yeah. We haven't we, we haven't split it by jurisdiction, but we could do that too. It's quite easy. Uh, so this is kind of what the report looks like, and basically uh, it is a number of pages on each type of vehicle, uh, very similar, like I said, to the uh, presentation today. Graphs, tables, and just uh, pulling out some important figures and a bit of a summary for all the different types of uh, prime movers versus trailers versus rigids, and breaking them down by, by continent. So, more of the same. Yeah. So that, uh, those reports that we provide, and we're launching them today, they have no make uh, information in them. So they are purely totals, or totals that are broken down into continents. Uh, we do also have make and model reports, as well as more, more detailed breakdowns, such as breaking down by state, or by axle, or whatever is, whatever is needed. Uh, and those are, are available separately particularly the make and model uh, breakdown reports uh, are a product that we provide and we have ready ready to go. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? The reports that you mentioned in the last slides they are as a PDF or an Excel file or what sort? Yeah, sure. So the reports that we're launching today are PDFs. So it, each vehicle type, so uh, trailer versus prime versus rigid, uh, it's a six page PDF for each, which just shows the kind of important trends and, and graphs in each one of those things. And then there's also six pages for each one of the uh, breaking those same categories down by continent. Uh, we do provide, we can also provide all this data in Excel form. Uh, and all the make reports that we produce are, are Excel, Excel based, but we find that the <coughs> PDF information is a bit easier to, to digest. So we, we are now, that will be the primary form that we give out as data. There are two uh, other vehicle, heavy vehicle databases that have been foreshadowed but not yet created. I'll just mention those to finish off. The, Federal Department of Infrastructure is currently proposing or working on a new Motor Vehicle Standards Act. And as part of that project, they are proposing that a new database be completed, that be created, that has basically gives a history of every VIN number. So you would be able to do a public search on a VIN number and find out when it was, how it got into the country or its compliance plate number is, and, and basically how it got registered, and it got, into the, got into the system. That's pre-registration, I should say. So if you have a personal import, for example, that vehicle will not have a compliance plate, but it would still show up in this, this uh, VIN database. They haven't created that, and we don't know how long from now it will be created. The National Heavy Vehicle uh, Regulator is also proposing to establish a new database and that database is going to be driven by operators. I believe that the proposal is, and this is just talking at the moment, the proposal is that the, the regulator will have access to a database that shows what companies own what vehicles. So they're going to add another level Internetness, if you like, which will tie the vehicle to a particular operator, and maybe that operator will have a number in the, in the regulator system. Again, that hasn't been uh, formalised, it hasn't been announced, but I can tell you that the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator is actively working on it and uh, has spoken to ARTS, or their consultant has spoken to ARTS on two or three occasions about what we've got and how it might be transitioned into. Regulators system. Is there any scope? Um, is there any scope to include, particularly on prime mover and trailer uh, suspension configuration? So we have the idea of axles, but obviously the towards and bar and this, etc. Is there a way to base it on the certificate numbers that we can actually track? We we can't do it. What we we sort of can do we tried hard was to make some estimates of what suspensions are used on what models, but that's a task we haven't gone to. The question of whether the regulator would be interested in gathering that information is quite an interesting one. I think the regulator at present is trying to figure out what should be in the regulator's database, and there may be a case for that. Getting back to the crash statistics area, the regulator has also an interest in creating a heavy vehicle safety database. But the regulator has spoken about creating a, a heavy vehicle incidents database, not just for police data. And, and the regulator might be interested in inviting the operator community to actually contribute the data to that. So this would include EMS type data or minor crash data. Uh, again, that's a, a way off, as Daniel Elkins is uh, working on this uh, in Brisbane and has spoken to us about it as well. So I think we're. Uh, yeah, I might just say, I think me and Peter will probably be sitting uh, behind the registration desk during lunch and for during the afternoon. 
you don't want to come ask any questions or see the slides or whatever, um, we'll have copies of what those reports are so you can come and take a look at them as well. Okay. How's that like time performance? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, I heard that. <laughs> Okay, we're going to break for lunch and we'll be back here in an hour and five minutes. Uh,